thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. You may press star 1 on your phone now to join the queue for questions. I would like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Michael Cook. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual event. My name is Michael Cook, and I'm the Senior Advisor for Strategic Communications in the Director's Office. Today's webinar is the first webinar the Census Bureau has held to announce important updates about plans for the 2030 Census. Today, we'll be fo focusing on three key aspects, research projects, testing strategy, and timeline. There will be three speakers today discussing these topics. Speaking today will be Census Bureau Director Roberto Santos, Associate Director for Decennial Programs, Deborah Stempowski, and Deputy Chief of the Decennial Census Management Division, Daniel Doyle. Immediately following these presentations, we'll begin taking your questions. Please note, if you are watching today's webinar via YouTube, you'll need to dial into the phone line to ask a question. That phone is listed on your screen now. If you already know what you'd like to ask, you can get in line now to ask a question by dialing star 1. Without further delay, I now turn it over to Director Santos. Director? Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for an update on our planning of the 2030 Census. Yes, the road is long. We're still early in our trek towards the launch date to the next decennial census. There's still much research, testing, and learning that lie ahead. We recognize it's important for you to be kept apprised of where we are in our preparations. That's why we're having this seminar. Uh, it's just the first of many communications about our preparations for the 2030 census that will be coming your way. We're committed to openness and transparency, and we need your feedback. In fact, last year, we asked for the public's ideas on planning and designing the 2030 Census. It was the first time we asked the public input on the design phase of a census, and the response was tremendous. We thank our colleagues, partners, and friends who responded on behalf of your communities. The deep thought and effort that went into your comments was evident. Now, we're, we very much need for you to stay engaged. The planning effort necessarily requires continuous research, design, and testing across the decade. And these efforts are enhanced when we work together towards a complete and accurate census. This is deeply important work. It's a labor of love. And I can't thank you enough for joining and helping us write the story of our next census. It's a story of partnership, a story of respect, and deep commitment to excellence. We appreciate your support and your enthusiasm. Now, let's get to the details on the work that's underway. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dan Doyle, Deputy Chief of the Decennial Census Management Division, who will take the reins. Dan? Thank you, Director Santos, and uh, welcome, everybody. Before I jump into today's presentation, I first want to recap for you information that we've already shared as context for today's webinar. You can find all this information on our website at www.census.gov forward slash 2030 census. We have already shared that we are currently in the design selection phase. And we've also shared that our approach to designing the 2030 Census is based on enhancing the 2020 Census design. And we have shared with you the input received from stakeholders through the Federal Register Notice on the 2030 Census research. Finally, we have outlined the five enhancement areas, or focus areas, that guide our 2030 Census research. Today's webinar will provide greater detail on the research projects being undertaken in the enhancement areas, as well as our broader research and testing strategy. We will also present a more detailed planning timeline and highlight 
how our research and testing fit into the broader planning strategy. Now let's dive into the 2030 Census research products. These research projects are assigned to five focus areas we refer to as enhancement areas, or EAs. And they play an important role in operationalizing our focus on building on what we successfully implemented for the 2020 Census. As you can see on this timeline, these projects began at the start of fiscal year 2022 and will conclude by the end of fiscal year 2024 so that the accepted recommendations from this research can be integrated into the first iteration of the operational design, also planned for public release in December of 2024. We will share specifics about these projects later in the presentation. Our approach also involves other research and improvements conducted throughout the decade. These are being informed by lessons learned from the 2020 Census, stakeholder input, and results of 2020 Census evaluations, assessments, and experiments. The additional research We'll also explore formal privacy implementation for the 2030 Census. There are plans to produce a research plan for data products and formal privacy implementation. The public will have an opportunity to provide feedback on these plans earlier in the decade than what was done for the 2020 Census cycle. We are currently in various stages of completing over 50 enhancement area research projects. This portfolio will be updated based on the continued review of the Federal Register Notice Commons, both by Census Bureau staff and our advisory committee. Let's take a look at our five EA. The first is data collection, where we are advancing our data collection methods to effectively reach and count everyone, particularly historically undercounted populations. This enhancement area includes four sub-EAs with a combined total of 23 projects. These are self-response, in-field and in-office enumeration, response data quality and questionnaire content, and the post-enumeration survey. Next, the Modernized Group Quarters Enumeration, EA, includes research on better ways to count people living in correctional facilities, nursing homes, college student housing, and other complex living situations. This includes seven projects. The integrated data collection and process in near real time EA looks at ways to improve data quality in real time. This EA has 11 projects. The Streamline Operational Support Infrastructure EA seeks to provide a strong foundation of people, places, and IT to support our operations. There are six projects in this EA. Finally, the six projects in the Continuous Data Collection and Aggregation EA cover research into how we can leverage existing data sources and seek new ones for use in the 2030 Census, while also capitalizing on the Census Bureau's own transformation. You can learn more about these EAs and specific projects through our 2030 Census Research Explorer tool by visiting www census.gov forward slash 2030 hyphen census hyphen research hyphen explore. This tool provides a summary of each enhancement area and a description of all the projects along with their research topics and questions. It also shows you how to search by keywords or filter by an enhancement area. Now let's walk through the explore tool and share three projects as examples of the range of enhancements we're researching. We encourage you to check out the tool to learn more about all the projects underway. The three examples I'll be sharing today relate to group quarters enumeration, administrative records, and the communications campaign. The first project I'll highlight is part of the enhancement area, Modernizing Group Quarters Enumeration, and it's titled, Creating an Internet Self-Response Option for Non-Institutional Group Quarters. You can find this project on our Explorer tool in two easy ways. First, you can use the drop-down menu, Filter by EA, to select Modernizing Group Quarters Enumeration, like the example on the screen. Alternatively, you can type keywords or interests into the search box, 
like group quarters or internet response. If you filter by the enhancement area, the tool will display all the projects under the EA you selected. If you search by keyword, the tool will display all the projects that include those keywords in the project title or the information available within the tool. Once the project appears on the screen, click anywhere in the project description to see more details. As you can see, the Explorer tool provides a breakdown of specific research topics and questions. This particular project focuses on developing an internet self-response instrument for certain types of non-institutional group quarters, such as college, student housing, or military barracks. This instru instrument will support the 2030 Census Group Quarters enumeration operation. It will be an online tool that allows the respondents living in certain non-institutional group quarters to complete and submit their individual census questionnaire electronically. It addresses re research topics such as how best to link respondents to group quarters and whether group quarter residents will understand how to respond to our census. Some of the research questions this project addresses are, what happens if the internet self-response instrument is not completed for residents at specified GQ types? How does that case get remapped to other forms of collection? How do we track whether all the residents of the group quarters are enumerated using the internet self-response instrument in order to know when the GQ's enumeration is complete? What are the optimal communication modes and messages to ensure group quarters internet self-response participation by GQ residents? The next project we'll look at is called Improving Within Household Coverage, and it falls within the Continuous Data Collection and Aggregation Enhancement Area. This project will explore methods for using administrative data to either add people into households where the census response omitted the person or remove people from households where the census response inappropriately included them. This project seeks to determine the accuracy of these added people and removed people by means of a follow-up interview during one of our several tasks. This project covers research topics such as demonstrating the use of administrative data to reduce under and over count, and improving household coverage using administrative data. Some of the research questions this project explores are, which administrative data are appropriate for reducing under and over count? And what rules or models should be used to add people to census's responses, to delete people or move them to a different address? Finally, let's look at a project titled Research to Improve Communications, Messaging, and Advertising Efforts, which is part of the Data Collection Enhancement Area. This project is driven by the lessons learned from past censuses that a successful communications and advertising campaign increases self-response, and improves data quality. This project includes four sub-projects that each contribute to the underlying goal of conducting research that will inform a data-driven communications campaign. The sub-projects aim to inform the design and content of the 2030 Census Communications campaign overall, as well as develop outreach strategies for historically undercounted populations. It addresses research topics such as measuring census barriers, attitudes, and motivators early and often, understanding barriers, and information consumption habits among historically undercounted populations, identifying and motivating response among historically undercounted populations, and designing effective targeting advertisement strategies. Some of the research questions it explores are how do perception of the Census Bureau, the Centennial Census, data privacy and confidentiality, and the federal government vary across demographic groups throughout the decade and leading up to the 2030 Census? Are historically undercounted populations aware of census results and the benefits during intercensal years? Or what types of message, channels, formats can effectively help decrease any concerns related to privacy, confidentiality, and institutional trust among historically undercounted populations? And how can the 2030 Census campaign be designed to motivate 
these populations to respond. All of the information that we provided in the tool is available for download. Click Download Project Descriptions at the top of the screen to download a PDF copy. Now that we've reviewed our research projects, I'm going to turn it over to Deb Stempowski to tell you more about our testing strategy. Deb? Thanks, Dan. In 2020, the Census Bureau conducted the most automated, modern, and dynamic decennial census in our nation's history. This included design changes that made it as easy and efficient as possible for people to respond to the census. We offered response options through the internet and by telephone, in addition to the traditional paper response. This also allowed people to respond to the census from any location at any time. We leveraged satellite imagery to conduct the majority of address canvassing in the office, which reduced field work. And we optimized field enumeration by providing mobile devices to enumerators and automating their work assignments each day. Another design change we implemented was using high quality administrative records when self-response and one visit did not result in a completed census response. This experience informs our approach to testing the 2030 census design. The major operational changes and new technologies implemented for the 2020 census were validated through successful implementation in 2020. Now our focus is to build on the experiences and innovations of the 2020 census expand systems to leverage existing functionality while introducing innovations through small-scale testing, and also anticipate potential challenges and the evolving world. The 2030 Census Testing Strategy responds to this context. For the 2030 Census, our testing strategy involves conducting ongoing small-scale testing throughout the decade to refine the operations and technologies that work successfully for the 2020 Census, as well as introduce additional innovations for the 2030 Census. These ongoing small-scale tests provide us with faster feedback and results, so we can make adjustments and retest again quickly if we desire to do so. We will then conduct major field tests in 2026 and 2028 to integrate new and enhanced features and ensure end-to-end -end operational viability and cohesion. Our approach to research and testing for the 2030 Census is tailored to the anticipated level of IT and operational risks, as well as the level of modernization required. Our strategy reflects this decade's focus on enhancements, specifically enhancing the 2020 Census design rather than re-envisioning the design as we did for the 2020 Census. As we mentioned previously, the 2020 Census involved major operational changes and the implementation of new technologies. These required extensive research and testing. Many of these changes were planned in advance of 2020, while some were implemented to pivot to meet the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Those methods and systems were validated through the successful implementation in 2020. We are now building upon those innovations and developing new ideas and methods to use in the 2030 census. Small scale testing allows us to frequently and iteratively evaluate new methodologies and systems and determine whether those innovations require additional field testing. The small scale test also deliver swift, well-defined results. Leveraging administrative data for in-office enumeration also enables approaches that do not require frequent major field tests. We also learned by conducting the 2020 Census during a pandemic that we can be more agile in how we conduct our operations. The types of small-scale testing methods that we may use for the 2030 Census include self-response tests, small-scale tests of field-related work, simulation and modeling, and cognitive testing. Hold on. Oops, one second. Sorry, Catherine. 
self-response test may include internet, paper, and telephone response options. The first small-scale test, self-response test of this decade, the 2023 census test, gathered insight into how people engage with the online census questionnaire and the invitation materials they receive in the mail. Further self-response tests are planned to explore ways to assist responders and increase self-response to the census. These include improving methods used to collect household rosters and improving the way householders respond without a census ID. Field tests involve small-scale focused tests conducted in the field to evaluate specific enhancements for those field operations. They generally involve minimal contact with the respondents. Simulation and modeling efforts tend to simulate processing activities and include computer-based simulation and models or manual tabletop simulation exercises. These activities typically use existing data, such as data from the 2020 census. Cognitive tests are used to pretest how people answer and perceive interview questions and how they interact with self-response instruments. What types of enhancements are we looking at with our small-scale testing? Some of the examples include strategies for contacting and motivating respondents, approaches to creating the household roster, allowing people to easily respond for vacant or seasonal homes, barriers, attitudes, and motivators of census participation, internet self-response options for residents living in non-institutional group quarters, such as student housing and military barracks, navigating to an address using points of latitude and longitude, new infield enumeration procedures, and response processing. In addition, we will conduct two major field tests in 2026 and 2028 to ensure operational viability and end-to-end -end cohesion. The first major field test, the 2026 census test, will be based on the first operational design, which will include recommendations from the Enhancement Area Research Project and other research and small-scale testing. Note, we don't expect the 2026 census test to be a full end-to-end -end test. Through this first field test approach, We'll test the proposed new and enhanced systems and methods and evaluate them to ensure both feasibility and a cohesive sense of design. We will also collect data for future response and cost models for our census operations. After the 2026 census test, we will have time to review the results and make necessary adjustments before we deploy our operations and systems again in the 2028 dress rehearsal. The 2028 dress rehearsal involves the start to finish run of operations and the handoffs between them. It is the last chance to fine tune processes and systems and ensure readiness before the 2030 census implementation. The key takeaways for today are the following. Our research and testing strategy is optimal for the 2030 census and builds on the successful design implemented for the 2020 census. It enhances operations and technologies that work for the 2020 census, introduces innovations through small-scale testing, expands systems and methods, and also ensures the integration of improved features. Here is the timeline that reflects our research and testing strategy for the 2030 census and how it fits into the broader 2030 census planning. This timeline is also available on the 2030 Census webpage at www.census.gov forward slash 2030 Census. We look forward to consulting with you throughout the decade as shown on the timeline, and thank you for joining today's webinar. So now I'll turn it back over to Michael Cook. Michael? Thank you, Deb. Now we're ready to take your questions. Operator, can you please give instructions on how people can submit their questions? Yes, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name. If you need to withdraw your question, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1.
Our first question comes from Hansai Lo Wang from NPR. Hi, Hansi. Hi, Michael. This is Hansi Lo Wang from NPR News. Um, what contingency plans is the Census Bureau putting in place in case the Bureau has to scale back testing plans because of funding uncertainty or funding limitations over the next few years? Hi, Hansi. This is Deb. Nice to uh, speak with you again. I think actually uh, the change in testing strategy for the decade uh, provides us the contingency plan and our regular plan, if you will. Based on all of the small-scale testing that we're doing, uh, we're able to learn very quickly uh, and adjust and improve operations uh, without counting on those big field tests to give us that information. So by doing the testing continuously throughout the decade, uh, we're giving ourselves a lot of learning opportunities should we have to make any adjustments uh, to the test in 2026 and 2028. Thank you. If I can ask a follow-up question, does the Bureau have a research and testing strategy to specifically address the persistent overcounting of the non-Hispanic white population? If not, why? Uh, I, let me answer that more broadly. Uh, so our research agenda is robust in trying to target all aspects of either undercount or overcount. So we've tried to do a thorough job in investigating all aspects, and I, I think that's one of the big benefits of having the Federal Register notice uh, solicit input from everyone to make sure that we've thought about everything, uh, considered ideas that maybe wouldn't have been uh, it first mind for us. So we have done a comprehensive review and we're going to implement those ideas in the research agenda to make sure uh, we can dive into that both overcounting and undercounting to understand and improve going towards 2030. Thanks for that, Deb. Operator, we're ready for our next caller. Our next question comes from Mike Schneider from Associated Press. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hi, how are you all? Um, I guess uh, if, if whoever wants to answer this question, I, I was wondering um, what research is taking place on the role artificial intelligence will play uh, in the 2030 census? And then I guess the same question for climate change, you know, as far as sending census takers out uh, uh, to knock on doors in Phoenix in the summer of 2030. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's start with artificial intelligence. Mike, nice to talk to you again. Uh, that's something that's right, very much emerging and a new technology that we believe will have benefit to the census, but we're in our early stages of research. So what I commit to now is as we develop our research plans around that, we'll share uh, our learnings and our ideas so we're being transparent with where we might use that. Uh, while we don't have a specific research plan around climate change, I'd like to hearken back to uh, some of the processes that we implemented back during the 2020 census. Uh, I'll use uh, perhaps the West Coast wildfires, where through the Census Bureau's Fusion Center, we're constantly monitoring uh, conditions across the country, and that would include extreme heat. So. We will take it that into account and we'll make decisions on when it is safe to have our boots on the ground, much like we did during 2020 when we had concerns about uh, the air quality from the wildfires in California. But thanks for your questions. All right, operator, we're ready for our next caller. Our next question comes from Chief Nanya Eel from Chickata Nation of Yamasee. Uh, it's uh, uh, Yamasee Moore's uh, um, Atsakata Nation. Thank you. Uh, my question, uh, anyone in the panel can answer this. Uh, what is the procedure when race and ethnicity, because you have the right to self-identify under the U.S. Census, what happens when agencies, law enforcement, refuse to accept an individual who has self-identified, whether they've done the census or an SF-181? What is the procedure in case that is not honored? I think I uh, might need to clarify. I can speak for the Census Bureau that um, the Census Bureau accepts self-response from anyone who provides it to us. Uh, we don't share that back with anyone in law enforcement or those 
agencies. That's something that we keep for ourselves. So I can only speak on behalf of the Census Bureau, but we honor what people self-identify as when they respond in the census. And a quick follow-up question. OMB Directive uh, has published those. So since that's in the Federal Register, isn't there an obligation on other departments, regardless whether they don't send it into the U.S. Census, but they have self-identified, they have filled out an SF-181 form, uh, isn't there an obligation for those agencies to honor that? Um, Because even when they send out the census for 2026 and 2028, if they come to someone's house and they say, I self-identify, and they give the race and ethnicity, isn't that supposed to have been honored, even though they have filled out the documentation? That's that's the reason why I'm asking. Right. And, but I think you're asking, if I'm uh, hearing you correctly, about forms that other agencies are using, and I really can't speak on their behalf. I can just commit to you that the Census Bureau will implement the updated race and ethnicity standards. Uh, when they are com- when they're recommended from OMB, uh, and we will honor people's self identification of their race and ethnicity when we implement. Okay, so would they have to send that into if they did it with a different agency? They still have to notify U.S. Census. Is that what you're saying? Yes, the Census Bureau collects our own data. If we are doing any kind of administrative record sharing, we would be, if it's an agency we share records with, we would be able to receive that information, but we will always count uh, somebody's self-response and honor that when you respond in the census. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. Operator, we'll take our next caller. Our next question comes from Allison Pryor from the Data Center. Can y'all hear me? Hey, can y'all hear me? Good. Again, loud and clear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good. Great to see you all again. I have two questions. One is super easy, and you might have said it. Um, I saw on the timeline that you're looking to receive feedback on this excellent 2030 plan. And is, there, is that going to be through an FRN, or um, if you can um, let us know about that, which maybe you were planning to anyway. Maybe I'm jumping the gun. Um, and my other question, you know, I'm, I'm, there's a number of things I'm interested in, but I'm really interested in the phone response possibilities, um, because during the 2030, you know, if someone called in, what they heard was a strong encouragement to go to the Internet, right, rather than an actual operator who just took their response Mm -hmm. right then and there. And I'm wondering what kind of research you're doing on on what happened in 2020 in terms of people who called in and how many got pushed away and, you know, uh, what that might tell us about um, um, better utilizing that attempt at self-response that might have gotten thwarted. Mm-hmm. So uh, one, why don't we take the first one? Hi, Allison. Nice to talk to you again. Um, ways to get input or uh, hear from folks on different parts of the census. I'll, I'll make it more broad brush. Um, while we haven't planned to do a federal register notice, what we have planned to do uh, are, is webinars like these where we can uh, be transparent with what we're doing, what we know when we know it, share it, and uh, hear people's questions and feedback during sessions like these. Um, and, and flipping then to uh, your other question on the telephone, uh, our CQA operation did a robust evaluation of, of what happened in 2020, and I think you were asking about, you know, how were calls dispositioned, what happened to folks, um, when the phone came in, did they respond, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have research projects underway in our inventory that are looking at um, different aspects of the phone operation. And another big input to that, of course, is the big um, lessons learned and then the formal assessment from the CQA operation. So I think we're doing uh, what you were speculating, hoping that we're doing by learning from what we did in 2020 and making that phone operation more efficient so that people who need to use the phone as a response mode get the best experience possible. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And operator, we're ready for our next caller. Our next question comes from Charlotte Little from NAVA. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my, hi, uh, my question has to do um, with the tribal government. I'm really uh, pleased to hear that they're going to be included in testing. Um, and my question is, can you tell us how many and where these t- 
testing locations will be held. And uh, the reason I ask it in that fashion is because uh, in tribal communities, their geographic locations uh, may affect what is possible, whether they have Internet access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did we lose her? Are you still there, Charlotte? Well, I, why don't I jump in, Michael, and I can answer in case she can hear us and we can't, we can't hear her. Uh, your question, Charlotte, was around uh, the locations of where we'd be doing testing in terms of uh, tribal areas. And we're still determining uh, locations. So we want to make sure we're doing testing in areas that allow us to reach the test objectives and learn what we need to know. Um, you're exactly right. There's unique circumstances around some of the tribal areas, uh, but that's why we'll also be doing testing in those areas. So it's a little bit early yet to talk about locations, uh, but certainly some of these unique challenges will be driving where we decide to do testing so we can learn what we need to know to make sure the tribal areas can have uh, an easy and efficient response in 2030. Thanks for that, Deb. And given that Charlotte dropped off, now's as good a time as any just to remind folks. Charlotte, by chance, if there are additional questions that you did not get to ask and you'd like to get answers to them, please reach out to our public information office right after the call, PIO at census.gov. And if any caller that is calling or getting into the queue does not have an opportunity to ask their question, you can do that as well. Um, operator, we'll go ahead and take our next call. Our next question comes from Anu L. Greetings. Can everyone hear me? Loud and clear. Yes, we can. Yeah. Hi. How was everyone? Doing just fine. I'm Fabulous. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm reading up that the Census Bureau's mission is to serve um, as the nation's leading provider of quality data about its people and economy. And former um, President Barack Obama was, was quoted stating on the Tom Joyner morning show that the word black has no standing at law. And the term African American is actually registered with the United States Patent and Trade Office as a corporation that's registered and listed under the category of meats and processed foods. So my question is, is it the Bureau's position that the term black and the phrase African-American are quality data about the dark-skinned people in the United States? I'll take that one, if I might, Deb and mm -hmm. Dan. Um, thanks for that line of questioning. Just to remind you um, mm -hmm. that today's line of questions are um, public event is to talk about the 2030 census research that's going on. But as you may know, um, the Office of Management and Budget is the agency that actually sets forth the race and ethnicity declarations and definitions that all uh -huh. fiscal agencies within the United States follow. And they are currently going through the process of trying to update and make updates and take recommendations from the public on the 1997 standards, which are currently being deliberated. Um, if and when there is a change and that it's announced by the Office of Management and Budget, the Census Bureau, just like all the other federal agencies, will actually have to adopt and to ingest um, those new definitions in their censuses and surveys. And so if you have any additional questions or you'd like to get some more background or, or talk to the people who've done race and ethnicity testing at the Census Bureau, please reach out to PIO at census.gov. And we do have information on our website that talks about all the race and ethnicity testing that we've done um, over the last couple of decades, actually, um, at the Census Bureau in particular. But thanks for that line Fabulous. of question. Fabulous. You're very welcome. And could you, um, would you please put the, back on the screen the, so I could take a screenshot of the POI um, email address that you, that you talked yeah, yeah. about? Yeah. Oh, there it I'm is. Right take there. A quick, I'm going to take a quick picture of it real quick, okay? It's PIO at census.gov. <laughs> And the phone number is 301-763-3030. And the 1-800 number is 1-877-861-2011 for those who, who are following us um, through audio only. But thanks for that. All right. Thank you so much for your time and your courtesy. You're welcome. Operator, Bye -bye. we'll take our next caller. Our next question comes from Raina Canelli. 
Hi, Raina. Hi, um, I'm from Sierra Lee, and my question was about the group quarter count of H-2A agricultural workers and making sure that farms actually count those workers. And then I also had a question about one of the things that I saw was people that are houseless or live off-grid or on reservations or had P.O. boxes didn't receive the mailer with the number. So when they would call, they would get rejected because they didn't have an actual physical address that a postman delivers to. Okay. So, hi. Uh, nice to meet you. So, your first question on group quarters procedures, I think we are, uh, we actually have a whole enhancement area around group quarters, so we're looking at how we can better and more effectively do that. Part of that actually includes the definitions of group quarters, and uh, that inherently involves who you should count in there. So, big part of our research agenda focused on group quarters, uh, so I think, um, Improvements will be made on that front. And your second question, ah, can you remind me what your second question was? Just Is that people words? that don't have a physical address, people, if that's you're right. houseless yeah. or off grid, <laughs> you were getting rejected off the phone line. Right, um, which the, um, I was not aware that was happening. So when you are, uh, don't have a mailable address uh, in the census, we usually come visit you, and when you say on reservations, we uh, do in-person drop-off of forms uh, instead of using the mail. So one thing that we did during COVID that I think is the innovation we want to bring forward, we actually used um, something called the uh, uh, Every Door Direct Mailer where we started using mailboxes, which isn't our traditional way that we do things, but we found we were able to get folks uh, through that way. So we have a project within our uh, research where we're going to look at how we can use that better. So we're trying to expand the ways that we connect with people, especially when they don't have mailable addresses, to ensure that they can respond. So thanks for your questions. Thank you. And operator, we're ready for our next caller. Our next caller comes from Afriti Mahat Amun. Hi Greetings. Greetings. Uh, Saferti Maasamun Rael. I'm a member of the Atsikata Nation of the Masi Moors. Greetings. How, how is everyone? We're doing just well. fine. <laughs> That's one. Uh, my question uh, kind of sparked in light of uh, you talking about, or the questions coming in about the OMB and the SF-181. And my question uh, and concern is, will the uh, census moving forward, focus on the concerns of the original peoples of Turtle Island, as it describes in the OMB, it says the original peoples, original peoples, but when it gets to black, it says racial groups. So then when it gets to white, it says the original peoples of the Middle East, Europe, and um, North Africa. Maybe not in that order, forgive me for that. But my concern is, uh, with the Negro Act of 1740 and the Negro Act of 1724, where the genocide was done on the indigenous people, the Americans of Turtle Island, will the census focus on that as they correct the wrongs of misidentifying the original people of this, of this land? Just a quick reminder, um, the, um, as stated earlier, the Census Bureau, we follow the directives of self-identification and the and race and ethnicity standards that are set forth by the Office of Management and Budget. I forgot to mention or overlooked mentioning earlier, there's a website. It's spd15revision.org, spd15revision.org. On that website, you will see and be able to have access to um, the process that the interagency work group has been going through over at OMB um, to make updates to the 1997 standards to race and ethnicity. The Census Bureau, as Deb noted earlier um, to a previous caller, um, we actually, when it comes to the census, we ask people to self-identify their race and ethnicity. And the questions that are on the census are set forth by the standards that are declared by the Office of Management and Budget. So, I appreciate your line of question, but um, I know that the SMEs that are here today, um, this is not their forte, and the Office of Management and Budget 
is really the the state the agency that that needs to address that line of questioning. But so I encourage you to reach out to them or to check that website for more information. Thank you, operator. In, in honor of my answer, thank you for your answer. You're very welcome. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Operator, um, is there? Do we have another caller? Or do we have another caller in the queue? As a reminder, please press star 1 if you would like to join the queue. As we wait for questions to come in, I want to um, highlight a few resources for today's re release, if I can. Um, they can all be found on census.gov, including the slide deck from today's presentation. You should be able to find links to these resources on our homepage on census.gov. Um, so just a reminder that census.gov is your lifeline if you are looking for access to the slides that you saw today. And also, um, once the presentation is complete, um, we'll obviously post it on our website, as we've done in the past, for you to, to watch it in, in the future, near future. Operator, do we have our next question? Yes. We have a question from Hansi Lo Wang from NPR. Hello again. Hi again. If no one else has other questions, I wanted to ask, is the intention that these 20, 2030 census webinars, this series, going to essentially replace what was the program management reviews for the 2020 census? Or will there be, in addition to these webinars, quarterly, more comprehensive quarterly program management reviews for the 2030 census? So, I, hi again. Um, I think what we're trying right now is to take advantage of new ways to communicate. Uh, and this is uh, a, an easy way for us to reach a lot of people quickly. So, um, we'd like to see what else we can do based on our learnings and how all we've uh, gotten used to being online and making that convenient for folks. So, right now, our plan moving ahead, at least in the short term, is to do uh, regular webinars so we can get information out quickly to folks. And is there a plan to, I think one thing, the PMR, as I understand, used to be in person, but in addition to that, they also uh, touched on, you know, schedules and budgets and strategies on a wide range of mm -hmm. aspects of the decennial. Um, seems like the webinars are going to be very, you know, one or two topic focused. Is there going to be a, a public check-in about various aspects of the decennial before uh, 2030? So I think where we are in the decade right now, this is the kind of information that we have to report. And this is not too dissimilar from the kind of information that we were reporting earlier in the decade last time. So as we progress through uh, moving uh, closer to 2020 or 2030, oh my gosh, 2030, we will start to provide some of that more traditional information that you're talking about. But right now we're providing uh, really what the updates are at this point in the decade, and that will evolve uh, as we get closer to uh, the 2030 census. Thank you. And if I might take liberties, Deb, don't know if I'm overstepping here, just to remind Hansi and others um, who um, followed us closely leading up to the 2020 census, the uh, PMRs, um, the primary purpose from our standpoint um, was an update um, and giving a briefing to GAO and IG um, as well as some of our um, appropriators. So I know that, you know, Hanzi, you and other media who actually showed up were there to, to watch that process go forward. Um, and so that's why some of the content that you're hearing today isn't as direct and um, talking about, you know, timetables and budgets and things of that nature. So just to to point that out, that, that delineation mm -hmm. is for you, if I could. Operator, um, do we have a new caller? Yes, our next question comes from Andrew Swenson from Indianapolis MOP or MPO. Yeah, hello, Andrew. Hello, folks. Um, the MPO is a transportation planning organization. I don't know if you're familiar with the term. Uh, we've been responsible for managing the census geography programs, uh, updates the census tract and block boundaries, and we're also very interested in the urbanized area boundary, which governs um, what our boundary is as an MPO, what we're responsible for federal transportation planning money. 
So I have two questions. One is um, just to understand what the re what the release schedule is. It looks like you have a pretty aggressive uh, census program development this time around, and I'm wondering if there's something similar on the geography side, and if you'll be using this this particular avenue for uh, uh, for providing that information as to what the geography programs are going to be doing. And I guess the other question I had is is whether or not uh, what's concerned us is the impact of disclosure on the actual geographic boundaries themselves. And that is the very important privacy protections that are being put in place. Um, I'm wondering what kind of research, yeah, I know there's research going on. I just don't know if this is the appropriate place to talk about that research. Okay about the impact of that on actual geographic boundary definitions. A lot of our boundaries were based on older things. They're not, may not have enough population to support proper disclosure or useful disclosure. So I was wondering if there might be a, at some point a research into developing a new approach to doing tracks and blocker boundaries uh, that, that couple with the new disclosure policies. Mm -hmm. So those are just the two questions that we have, that I have. Well, I'll take the, the disclosure question to start. And um, just so we know, we're still working on the release for the 2020 census products. Uh, so that's really the focus of uh, the staff right now. Once we finish the 2020 data products, that's when we're going to shift the focus to the 2030 research for disclosure. And then we should have uh, uh, more information at that time. Okay, that's really good. And so, yeah, just to yeah. build on, I give you a little bit on the geography, but we don't have our uh, geography sneeze on this call. Um, our geography division has an aggressive agenda, which is going to take advantage of increasingly high quality and more available aerial uh, geospatial imagery. Uh, to make sure we have the the most up to date and uh, nimble frame in the world, in at least in the United States. But I think you know details on their aggressive research agenda, uh, et cetera, is a little bit out of the scope of this webinar. But I'd also turn your attention to the Census Bureau's Frames program, which is part of the transformation, and the Geography Frame is uh, nestled under that. I know you can get to it from census.gov. I don't have the, um, the detailed backslash right off top mind, but as part of the transformation and the frames, we are certainly pushing um, our geography frame to be best in class and adopt new, new methods uh, to keep it current and, and modern for our use and uh, probably your use too, it sounds like. Yeah, so thanks for the good. questions. Thank well, thank you very much for the answers. Appreciate it. And thanks for that. And I'm getting word that that was our last caller um, for today's webinar. So I'd like to um, thank everyone for joining us uh, for today's presentation. And also I'd like um, to um, let and remind everyone that additional questions that might come up after today's webinar, again, you can please contact the Public Information Office at 301-763-3030 or email us at PIO at census.gov, that's PIO at C-E-N-S-U-S dot G-O-V. Or if you have more general questions, please contact our Customer Service Center. And a reminder, you can find all the resources for today's release in our 2030 Census Press Kit in our newsroom. I'd like to thank today's pres presenters, uh, Daniel Doyle, Deb Stimpowski, Stimpowski, excuse me, and our director, Robert Santos. And I just remembered, I believe I gave out the wrong um, email address earlier for uh, OMB. That is not a .org website. It's a .gov. So it's spd15revision.gov, spd15revision.gov. For those who called in and wanted information, um, about OMB's interagency working group and how they are going uh, through the process of updating the, uh, uh, the 1997 standards, taking feedback from the public. Again, this has been Michael Cook, and I'll thank everybody for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.
that concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.